Hey developers, we are now entering a new chapter in our journey of PLC programming in Twinka 3, as we now will start the advanced series of this tutorial. Let me start by saying that even though the subject of this part is in the advanced part, it doesn't mean it should only be done by experts. Actually, it's not even advanced. The subject of today is version control. Version control is the practice of tracking and managing changes to software code. Version control systems are software tools that help software teams manage changes to source code over time. Doing version control is something that should be done by every single automation engineer. Not doing version control is unprofessional, no matter the project size. The question is not whether to use version control, but which version control system to use. This part of the tutorial was one of the trickiest of all to create, as I felt it was hard to decide what I should focus on. I've decided that in this part of the tutorial, I will only give a brief introduction to version control and focus more on the specifics for Twinka 3. Let's get started. Historically and unfortunately, still the traditional way to do revision of PLC software in the industry is to have a folder with your program and name it something like this example pacmachine underscore version underscore 0 0.8. A little bit later, someone makes a change to the project, but still wants to keep the old version just in case. What could happen here is that the PLC software developer makes a copy of the entire folder and renames the new version to something like this. Then a few weeks later, the project decides to do a release of the software and the developer or developers create another copy this time indicating that it is a release version. Shortly after release, bugs are found and this is where it starts to get funny. Now, another copy of the project is created indicating that it's just a minor fix. And this quickly spirals out of control. Eventually the developers end up with a bunch of folders and most likely they will stop keeping track of what is installed on the machine. And what if there is more than one developer on the project and code needs to be shared or code is to be maintained by someone else down the road? I've seen this numerous times where there in best case is a shared folder on some shared resource that all developers have access to, but more commonly the project is zipped and shared amongst developers. While this method can work, it is inefficient as many near identical copies of the program have to be maintained. This requires a lot of self-discipline on the part of developers and often leads to mistakes. Stop this madness and start to use a system that handles this for you. A version control system does this and much more for you and infinitely more efficient. With a version control system, you get software tools that help software teams to manage change over time. Although this picture gives the impression that the version control system are centrally handled, this is not always the case as we will soon discuss. So what are the benefits of using a version control system? First, a complete long-term change history of every file. This includes all changes made by every individual over the years. Changes include the creation and deletion of files as well as edits to their contents. This history also includes the author, date and written notes on the purpose of each change. Having the complete history enables going back to previous versions to help in root cause analysis for bugs and it is crucial when needing to fix problems in older versions of software. Branching and merging. It's not just about having team members working on a project at the same time but it's also beneficial for individuals working on their own in different branches of changes. Creating a branch in a version control system tool keeps multiple streams of work independent from each other while also providing the facility to merge that work back together, enabling developers to verify that the changes on each branch do not conflict. Many software teams adopt a practice of branching for each feature or perhaps branching for each release, or both. There are many different workflows that teams can choose from when they decide how to make use of branching and merging facilities in version control systems. 
Traceability Being able to trace each change made to the software and connect it to project management and bug tracking software such as Azure DevOps and being able to annotate each change with a message describing the purpose and intent of the change can help when you need to go back in time to see what changes you have done. There are several version control systems, the first ones dating all the way back to the 80s. Some of the common version control systems used in the traditional software development field are CVS, short for Concurrent Version System, SVN, short for Subversion, Git, short for, well, it can mean various things if you ask the inventor of Git, and proprietary version control systems, either created by the manufacturer of the PLC or some third party vendor. These version control systems can be either proprietary or be built on top of any of the popular version control systems, such as Git. A common delimiter between the last category is that they are usually costly and provide little to no value over the ones that are free, open source and traditionally used in the software industry. If you are using Beckhoff's Twinka 3, you don't need to give your hard earned money to these companies for the tools to do version control. The automation industry is really underdeveloped regarding version control. Most PLC vendors use their own proprietary way to store source code, which results in that the PLC vendors and third-party suppliers charge you big money for something so basic as version control, making the barrier for people not doing version control even higher. The vendors are either providing their own proprietary version control system and the tools that only works with their particular brand, or there are vendors that built a system on top of the popular version control systems, but then it only works if you use their software to do the version control. Not only are these tools expensive, but they are also add complexity and additional dependencies for external software. So who are the losers in having it this way? Most of us. So all automation engineers and system integrators. Actually, Everyone loses in having it this way, except for the PLC vendors and the third-party suppliers of costly version control tools that can cash in the sweet juicy cash by vendor locking people into their system. I know I have a lot of traditional software developers amongst my viewers of this tutorial. And yes, this is just one of the really sucky things about industrial automation. Everyone tries to squeeze every single dollar out of you even for something that you most for likely have taken for granted is free for the last decades. We as automation engineers have to stop this and tell our PLC vendors to get better. We have to tell them to start storing data in an open and human readable format and not in some obscure proprietary binary blob that you either have to reverse engineer to understand or be best friends with the provider in order to understand. We have to require them to include proper tools for doing version control. We have to require them to work together to use a common format for source code, either the one supplied from PLC Open that everyone just uses to export and import data to, or something else but that's common. If the manufacturers didn't do vendor lock-in and used a common format, I'd, amongst many other, would be quick on making a free and open source tool for version control for all the various PLC brands. If we don't start to require these kind of tools and support from the vendors, the industry will continue to have formats that are incompatible with each other. They or third-party companies will continue to charge a big time for their tooling. It's already hard to get automation engineers to do version control. We don't have to accept that things be this way. PLC vendors, please don't make it harder than it needs to be. If you don't change, it's just a matter of time before someone else does it and then your alternative won't look favorable anymore. The good news is that with Beckhoff and Twinka 3 you don't need to spend a single cent for version control tools. You can use all the tools that you are used in the traditional software development industry. Fact is, support for version control is already integrated into the development environment for Twinkat as it's based on Visual Studio which, which already is being used in the traditional software development industry. The traditional software industry has been doing version control for decades already. It gets even more important to use traditional version control tools when you will, when you will start to look into concepts such as 
continuous integration and continuous delivery, which I will be talking about in a coming video. I'm not saying Beckhoff are the best. Beckhoff at least store their code in a format that is human readable and that plays okay with version control systems such as Git. Doing version control with Twinka 3 is 100% 100 free. Not only are all the tools that we will use in this tutorial free, but most of them are also open source. I've been doing version control with numerous projects in various industries ranging from the deep ocean to the universe, using Twinka 3 and Git for over 10 years, and never had to pay a single cent for the tooling. The storage space and repository is not included in this of course, but the tools to do version control I've never had to pay anything for. I think this is how it should be across the whole industry, not just Twinket. I'm not saying Beckhoff are perfect, they could improve here as well and I made a video about that, a link is included in the video description below. Don't waste any money on the tooling for version control. Demand your automation provider to do better. For the remainder of this tutorial, we will be looking into and working with Git. Git was created by Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, as he thought all the current version control systems were lacking in some aspect. Like it wasn't enough to create an operating system kernel that is running on the vast majority of the servers and the vast majority of smartphones in the world. He has now also created the world's most popular version control system. It's impossible not to be fascinated by his selfless contributions to the world. Git is what is called a distributed version control system. What differs this from the more traditional centralized version control systems, such as SVN, is that Git uses multiple repositories, including a centralized repository and server, as well as some local repositories. So Git does not necessarily rely on a central server to store all the versions of a project's files. Instead, every user clones a copy of a repository and has the full history of the project on their own hard drive. This clone has all of the metadata of the original, while the original itself is stored on a self-hosted server or a third-party hosting service like GitHub. I'll give a very brief introduction to some concepts in Git, as it's necessary to have a basic understanding of how Git works before we start to use Git in practice. Let's first look at some of the main components of a Git project. First you have the working directory, which essentially is your project folder, where you store all your files and folders for the project. Next you have the stage, which sometimes also is called the index. The stage contains the changes that you have marked to be included in the next commit. We'll get to the concept of commits soon. The local repository tracks all the changes that you have made to files in your project, building a history over time. The final component is the remote repository. Remote repositories are versions of your project that are hosted on the internet or network somewhere. Note that you don't need to have a remote repository at all. You can have the full experience only with a local repository, though when working in a team also having a remote repository is preferable. Your basic Git workflow will normally look like this. First, you modify your files in the working directory. Next, you will stage the changes you want to include in the next commit by doing a git add. Commit your changes by git commit. Committing will take the files from the stage and store them as a snapshot in the local repository. Upload your local repository content to a remote repository with git push. In your working directory, every project file can be in three possible states. It can be staged, which means the files with the changes are marked to be committed to the local repository but they are not yet committed. It can be modified, which means the files with the changes are not yet stored in the local repository. It can also be committed, which means that the changes you made to the, your files are safely stored in the local repository. A git pull will incorporate changes that someone else might have done in the remote repository into the current branch. 
Now imagine that you have made changes in your code, meanwhile the remote repository was changed, and this can result in something called a merge conflict. When you do version control, you normally don't want to have all the software artifacts under version control. With most programming languages and software development platforms, there is a lot of files that is generated from the source code that you don't want to be tracked. Typical examples of these are object files and executables that are generated from the source code. As long as you have the source code, you can always create these files by simply compiling the source code. By using a .gitignore file in the root of your project directory, you can specify what type of files that you don't want to be under version control. For Twinka 3 projects, there is a starting template available on GitHub's repository for gitignore files for different programming languages. I've added a link in the video description to this file. Okay, that was a lot of theory and still I've only scraped on the surface of what I would like to go through with you. But now I feel I don't want you to get tired of theory, so let's get our hands dirty and do some practice. Okay, it's time again for a little bit of live programming, and I want to start by mentioning that this isn't going to cover everything you can do with Git. Actually, it's just going to briefly touch on uh, what you can do with Git, because there's just so much stuff you can do with it. The focus here will instead be how to work with Git in Twinket. There's, I'm going to make more videos about Git, because this is a very important subject. So I, of course, want to show all the capabilities and everything that's possible with versioning control in industrial automation. This is just going to touch on the very, very, the most important topics uh, in, in Git. And uh, I also want to mention that this video is that there's much more material covered than what I'm gonna talk about in this video. So there are two blogs which I highly recommend. One blog is from Roald Reuter. Reuter. Yeah, I, I have a little hard with the pronunciation of the name. Roald, anyway. It's a really good blog and he has a very good blog post about Git and version control. And the other one blog the other one's blog is Chris Schung. Uh, which also covers everything about Git that you need to know, also in relation with Twinket programming. So I really recommend that you visit Roald's and Chris blogs. I will provide links in the description below. So to Roald and Chris, I want to say you are awesome. With that said, let's get started. So the first thing we have to do is to download Git itself. So Git is the open source and free software that you use to, to do the versioning controlling. This is available for, for Windows, it's available for Linux, Mac, and all kinds of platforms. And we're of course gonna download for Windows because our development platform is based on Windows. Then the second software which we're gonna download is something called Tortoise Git. And this is just like a shell for Git itself. So it's the uh, it's the client that makes it possible to talk, uh, to use Git in an easy way. Because with Git, you, you only basically get the tools to do everything from the command line. And I would recommend you to learn command line stuff, because especially if you work on other platforms like Linux and stuff, where you mostly spend your time in the shell, and uh, it's really good to know. But for a lot of my viewers, I know you're coming from an industrial automation background. Maybe you're not used to using the shell and command prompt and stuff like this. And then for this, we need an additional piece of software to in, uh, so that we Git is more integrated into Windows. So you get just this uh, human machine interface GUI for to work with Git. And I want to mention that we actually don't need the Tortoise Git stuff because with Visual Studio, so with TCXAE Shell, so the development environment for Twinkat, we have a very good Git in integration. So we can basically do most of the Git stuff that we need to do directly from Visual Studio, which I will also show. But I just simply thought that I want to show you another alternative to just using Vis Visual Studio for the uh, version control, just to show on the concept that, hey, there's all these free and open source tools that, that you can use to, to do Git and more push on the point that, <laughs> that you don't need to pay anything to do version control with Git. And, and that's what I wanna point out here, that these are just examples of, so Git we need, this is the tool we need, but Tortoise Git is optional. We, there's many, many other clients we can use instead, uh, instead of Tortoise Git. There, there's many, many more options, and, and that's the nice thing. There's so many options and you don't have to pay for them. But let's start with downloading Git. So just look for Git SCM. You get to this website, Git SCM. And this is where you download Git itself, the binaries to do version control. 
and uh, download for Windows. So we're on a Windows platform, but if you actually go to downloads here, you can see there's uh, downloads for, for other platforms as well. But we'll go with Windows. This is a 64-bit system I'm working on, so I'm gonna download the 64-bit version. Then when it's downloaded, you start installing it. And here you can, you of course have to read all the terms. <laughs> and then you just, just press next. Uh, just press, press next, next, next. The, you can read everything. It's some people like to do some adjustments, but I would just press next, 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 next until it installs. Okay, once it's installed, I just want to show you that there is this git bash where you can do common line stuff uh, with git. So once this is installed, you get this uh, tool here uh, where, where you can do uh, stuff directly from, from the common prompt. And you can even do git directly from the normal Windows common prompt. So if you write git now, you can do, uh, you can do all this git, git stuff that, we will, that we've already talked a little bit about, about git add and, and commit. Uh, but we're not going to use the command prompt or the shell or anything. We're going to do everything through through Windows, through the graphics. So for this, we need to download Tortoise Git. Or Tortoise Git is, again, just one option. You have many others. Or we can skip to use Tortoise Git and just use Visual Studio. But I just I really, really want to show you these two alternatives that you can work with to, to do Git. Because all of this software, for all of them, it's, it's still just Git. So all of them will use the same concepts. So look for Tortoise. Tortoise, uh, Tortoise Git. I the, the reason actually I used Tortoise Git. It's, so the background to this is I started using version control. Uh, yeah, back in the late nineties. One of the first softwares I started when I came into contact with version control was Tortoise SVN. So this was the same program but for Subversion instead. And then you know when I sh shifted from when I realized that hey Git is much 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 better than Subversion, then it was just natural for me to, to go to, to Tortoise Git. So download 64-bit. But again, I want to point out that there's many, many other options to Tortoise Git. But I have to, sh I have to show you something, right? Okay, run. I would recommend you to run first Start Wizard. Because then you can choose the language, English. Next, uh, so this wants the path to the Git installer, and this is already installed because when we did install Git, it was installed into this folder. So that's what, why Tortoise Git just needs to know, hey, where is Git itself? Press, just press next, your name. So uh, just enter everything. Next, so actually I can just mention the settings you're doing here are something called git global config. So these are configuration, this is a configuration that's used for all git repositories. Then you can do custom uh, configurations for, for every repository itself. I'm not going to cover that so much now because we're only going to use the global git co uh, configuration. That's going to be common for all uh, repositories. Just press next. And now you actually need to reboot the computer. So I'm going to do that. You need to you need to reboot it because of this integration into Windows. Okay, so now we have Git installed and we have Tortoise Git installed. And what you'll notice now is if I right click here, then you see we have a couple of new menus in Windows. So this, oh, okay, the Twinkat logo always coming in the right time. Uh, so these are these two menus are the uh, are stuff that's coming from from Git itself, and this is uh, all these three is stuff that's coming from Tortoise Git. But I first want to say that for this tutorial I'm gonna use a program that we previously developed and I will do version control of it right because all the software we've developed so far we've only put it into a folder somewhere on the computer and not done any version control whatsoever of it which is bad right we should always already from the start of a project put the project under version control but to do that we need somewhere to host our git repositories Right, so we can of course host them on a server that we have on our hard drive. You can even do that. Actually, you can just put them on a network drive somewhere. But what you usually want to work with, and especially once you get into you know work with teams and, and colleagues and uh, just bigger software projects, you need an uh, external repository to store the code. 
for this, there's many different providers. There's providers, uh, there is GitHub, there is GitLab, there is Azure DevOps, you have uh, Amazon. There's many that provide a place for you to, to store the repository. And I uh, generally recommend for beginners to just use GitHub because it, first, yeah, it's the biggest one, but it's also very user-friendly, I would say. It's, it's very easy to create an account. It doesn't cost anything. It has a lot of features that you generally want to use when you work in Teams. So I have a GitHub account. Uh, I recommend you to just go to GitHub and register here because then we can create all our repositories here. So again, GitHub is just a place to store the repositories. But on top of that, it adds a lot of other services. It adds services to, for example, create issues, you know, so you can, you can, there, there's all these services around Git itself. Like you can create an issue for, for the software. And so you can have a ticket and follow it. So, you know, if you fixed a bug, you can close the ticket and you have, uh, automation stuff for doing this thing called continuous integration, continuous delivery, which I'm not going to cover here. I'm going to cover that in separate videos. Uh, but that's basically to build pipelines for, for building your software and do automatic testing and all this amazing stuff that I'm really pushing for everyone to do. But this is quite new in the field of industrial automation. And GitHub provides lots and lots of other stuff, like stuff for security, who should have access to, to these repositories and everything. And just go to GitHub register and or, or you can skip this step of course but then you need to provide your own place to initiate and create the, the repository but again this is the difference between git and github git that's the version control system itself github is a place to store github uh, git repositories and provide services on top of that first of all let's create a new repository and we do that here once we have the account on on github new repository and we're just gonna call this guy uh, test repo okay you can add a description and public or private just says whether this repository should be available for everyone to see you know so especially when you work with open source projects like the tc unit framework i've been working with then you want it to be public because you want everyone to see see this you want everyone to be able to help you with coding for this one we can just create private for private then you only you have access for it and this is typically you know when you work with with commercial projects like you work for a company or something you you, you just store everything privately and then when it's private you can of course adjust which github users should have access to this repository and there's some other stuff we can do here. Git ignore, I'll get back to this soon, but just for now, just create repository. And now you have a, a Git repository. So first of all, congratulations, you just created your first repository. Now you just take this address. So this is the address of the repository and we are going to clone it. So clone it means that we're gonna take this whole repository, that is this Git repository and make a local repository out of it. And you do that by, um, you go into your computer. Let's create a folder, call it uh, workspace. And we clone it here. And you do that by, again, you can do this by the command line, but again, I'm not gonna do anything today with the command line. I'm gonna do everything through the user interface. Here you do git clone. And then you enter the, the address from, from the GitHub repository. You press okay. And now it's cloning it and creating it in the, a local repository out of this. If you go here, you can actually see that there's a hidden folder here. And this is kind of the folder that Git uses to, to keep track of everything. So, and, and this is the nice thing with Git. You're actually cloning the whole repository. It's not like subversion where you have to have a connection to the remote repository for it to work. With Git, you know, you can, I've been working in, in places like far, 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 far away from internet connectivity, but I've been still being, I have still been able to do my commits and work uh, locally, which is such a fantastic feature with Git. So now we have a Git repository. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to put one of my programs that I developed before, so that we developed together in this tutorial under version control. And it's this PLC program too, which uh, yeah, we can just quickly look at it. It's this program where we used a sensor. So this is the program we used for the distance sensor, the IFM sensor to do some IO link when we were talking about hardware, so IO. So this is the, the, the program where we, where we just had a distance sensor from I, IFM. So this one is not under version control, but we will put it under version control. So I will close it. And uh, we have a git ignore file here. I'll delete it for now because I wanna show how this works. I will, we will, don't worry, we will recreate this git ignore. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take th this complete solution and just copy it over to here. So 
what's gonna happen now is that now we put these files here so they're not staged yet but we will stage them very soon so let's start by opening the solution because what i want to show you now is the integration of git in visual studio itself so tcxae shell in our case and now that the project is open there's actually a tiny tiny tab here and that's called team explorer and this is the guy that's going to help us with the whole versioning control and this is again i just really want to point out here that everything we're watching i haven't bought any license for any software all of this is stuff that you get for free from git uh, github as well actually for the repositories uh, but also the integration into visual studio is, is just the default integration of visual studio for versioning control that that Beckoff had used which is just a huge strength with Beckoff that they haven't built their own solution on, on top of git or their separate solution they just use the vanilla git that the rest of the software industry is using which is it's just so good. So I just want to point out that this is something that Beckoff have done tremendously well. Yeah. Thank you, Beckoff. So there's a couple of buttons here to go through and uh, I thought I'd just briefly go through them. Let's start with branches. So branches is something when you develop your software, you can add, for example, if you, let's say you're in a situation where you're a team and you're pe many people developing in software in the same repository on the same project. And then you want to add a feature. And the traditional way to, to develop software uh, is that then you create a branch and then you can add all your stuff in the branch, test it out, and then merge it in. Unfortunately, to show all of this is going to take some time. So I'm not going to show anything more about branches. I'm going to create a separate video about this. It's just important to know that there's this concept of, about branching in, in Git where you can basically grow like a tree, right? You have the main branch uh, and, and then out of that, it there's branches growing to left and right and you can uh, you can add some features and then put them back into the main branch so there's uh, there's many use cases actually for branches but i'm not going to cover it here we're going to do that in a separate video tags is basically just a way to mark a commit so right when you when you do your software you're going to do commits you're going to commit you're going to add features you're going to do commits and then at some point you're going to get to a level where, for example, you want to do a former release, right? You have a customer, you're going to do a release. Then you can put a tag on it and say that this is, the, the tag is just a label for a commit. So you can just say this is version 1.1. The tag is version 1.1. You call it version 1.1. And you can just put a label on, on your former releases. There, there's nothing magical about tags. It's actually just putting a, a label on a commit. I use this all the time when working with, with projects because at some point you end up in a, a situation where you have to do releases and then tags is the way to go. We're not going to do that here, but it's important for you to know. Then we have settings. This is nothing special. Here we have our global settings, which I briefly talked about. And because we already did the global settings in Tortoise Git, it's stored. We can see them here as well. So this is just what name and what email will be visible in, in all our commits. Then the interesting guys are the changes and the sync, which we're going to work with today. So ch with changes, you see all the files that have been changed since uh, the last time. And as you can see, because we haven't done any, any version control yet, basically everything we've added is visible here. So Git says, hey, you should add this file, add, you know, all of this is marked with add. So you can add these files into version control. And when we add them, just as I showed in the, in the presentation, we will stage them. But what's interesting here, if you notice, is that we have all these weird files like .suo, what's this? I have no idea what this is. And you have the, the compiled libraries here, you know, and these are typical files that we don't want to version control, right? I mentioned in, in, the, in the presentation about gitignore that there's certain software artifacts that you don't want to put under version control because they are a result of a compilation stage or and uh, these you don't want to, you just want to version control the stuff, uh, just the source code that you will use to generate these guys, but you actually don't need these guys in the, in the version control. So the libraries, for example, completely unnecessary because the libraries, there's something that follows with our development environment, or they're coming from another, uh, pro they're the output from another project. So this is something you have to keep track of. And luckily for you, we, there is a gitignore file default created already. It's in the GitHub official gitignore repository. So there is one for Twincat and I'm gonna show you how you add it for your project soon. So you see there's, yeah, these are actually even the, the binaries 
for our application. So if you compile the application, you'll get the output. So the, the actual executable that's going to run in the Twinkat scheduler is here as well. We don't want that either. We only want, you know, the here the TCPOU. So this is the main file, right? We want our function blocks. So our function block should be uh, here somewhere. Uh, no, it's not here because it's a separate library, of course, but uh, it, it's in another code. But we only want the raw source code, so to speak. What we need to do now is that we need to add a git ignore file to the root of this repository. And for this, you are very lucky because if you Google, uh, no, yeah, Google twinkat git ignore, then you're gonna end up either on my blog, number one, woo, or just simply go directly to this GitHub. And this is just a standard template. This works for the vast majority of Twinkat 3 projects. There might be some tune tunings you need to do, especially if you work with C++ and if you do if you do some special stuff, you might need to tune this file, but default this works for most projects. So just simply copy this guy. What did I do now? Raw. Here. Just copy, copy the contents of this guy, create a new file call it dot git ignore open it and just put everything here and as soon as you save it if you go back here now to visual studio you see how many of these files were were removed so suddenly lots of files are not recommended to add because that's what the git ignore file does the git ignore file simply tells us that hey git you should just ignore all of this stuff we don't want to put that under version control so suddenly we only have the stuff that's that's relevant for for our twinket project but you notice that there's actually one i just noticed that there's actually one file here that we don't want to put under version control and it's a .suo file and I've actually written that for Twinket, use this, but on top of the Twinket, you want also to use the Visual Studio Git Ignore file because that's for all the Visual Studio specific stuff. And, and this Suo file, that's something that's that's not Beckhoff specific, it's Visual Studio specific. So we need that as well. So just Google Visual Studio, Visual Studio Git Ignore, and then you end up here. You go raw copy everything and just put it at the bottom of your git ignore and save it and then, oop did you see immediately the suo file was removed and now we have a very very clean and nice project where we on, where we will only put the stuff that we should put under version control which is very good now what you can do is to stage these files and you can either stage them one by one so you can right click and put and uh, click on stage and bef but before i do that i actually want to show you that the git client that we have here in Visual Studio, it's just one of the git clients out of many. So you, you have the one that Microsoft have done for Visual Studio, which luckily Beckoff have made no adjustments to. So it's just using the raw stuff from, from Microsoft. And you can also use, if you go to the, to the workspace, to the test re repo, you can also use stuff uh, through Tortoise Git. So you can, you can go here to any file like the git ignore, right click on it, Tortoise Git and add. So this ad does the staging. I just want to show you that. There, so there's different ways to do this, right? With with this client, we can only work with Twinket and Visual Studio projects. So specific stuff that only for for actually for TCXA shell. With Tortoise Git, you can do it for much more. And and I wanted to point I wanted to point this out because you know I actually do I just don't do version control with my P, uh, software. I Nowadays, I do version control with most of my stuff I, I develop, right? If I, if I do a website or if I do a text document in, in certain uh, formats, I put it under version control. Since I started using version control over 20 years ago now, I've, I just use it for everything. And, and that's the thing. And, and this is what I like with the whole software industry. And this is why I love working with traditional software is that, you know, there's all these people just creating all of this stuff like Git and everything. And then there's people doing this nice open source project so you can, you can work with this. And, you know, it's just... It just drives the industry forward while all these custom solutions that have popped up recently but also that have been around forever in the automation industry they're just they're just they're just really bad you know it's, it's a shame that this is the direction that the industry has gone to anyway i'm gonna stop ranting what you want to do now is to add one way is to to simply stage one and one or you can just press this button and then it will stage all so we press that now all of these, uh, you can see state changes, all of them are staged. The next step is, of course, to do the, the commit itself. So now they're in the staging area, but they're not yet committed. 
you can also see it here. If you go back again to, to Windows, if you use the choice kit, you can see that all of them have gotten this plus sign. So um, you can't you can't add them anymore because they're already added by 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 Visual Studio because again both of them are using Git. And the next thing is to do a commit. And for commit you need to add a commit message and we can just write initial commit. Press this commit stage. This will commit all the staged files. Okay. And now Visual Studio is very nice because it tells us this commit so uh, is created locally sync to share your changes with the server and this is the important thing so far we've only committed locally into our uh, local repository by creating this local commit so a commit it's it's like a snapshot and this snapshot is not yet available on the remote repository so so far i mean so the stuff we've done now, you could just do this without any internet. But of course, at some point or another, you want to synchronize this with the remote repository so that all the other people that you're working with can see the changes as well. So, I mean, actually, if we, if we go to this test repo now and I press and I just go here, you know, there's, there's nothing. There's uh, absolutely, it's just empty. It just says, please uh, set, set up some files, but uh, we haven't pushed anything yet here. So the next step, is to go back here home you have the sync button and here with the sync you can push your local changes to the remote repository so you can push the stuff that you have in your local repository to the remote repository and by pressing push it's gonna do some stuff uh, do, do, do. successfully pushed branch main to Oregon and now if you go here press f5 you can see that the stuff we, we committed are now also in the remote repository. And now someone else can, can clone this project, you know, a colleague, and, and work with the same repository. And that colleague will also have a local repository, work with the local repository, and push. And here, you know, here it starts to get a little interesting, right? Because if you're more than one person, then you're going to end up in, you can end up in situations where you do changes to the same place, and these changes could create something called a conflict. Unfortunately, I'm not going to cover it for this. This is also something I will push to another episode of this tutorial, not of this tutorial, but a separate video uh, because it's just too much to cover. And this video is already insanely long, <laughs> but it's, 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 this is basically how we work in teams. So now we have everything here. When you work over time, you're gonna, of course, edit files. You're going to change files. And at some point you're going to end up in a situation, say, you know, you deliver the machine and uh, you want to know, hey, how did the code, what's the difference between how the code looks now and how the code looked like a week ago? And for this, you can do something called the diffs in Git. So you can compare a certain commit with a, another uh, previous commit. And I'm just going to show you this by simply, we'll just create another function block to this uh, code. So I'll just create, uh, yeah, actually, no, let's, let's not even not create another function block. Let's just create another instance of this uh, sensor that we're using. So we just create another instance. So let's say we have another uh, a second distance sensor and we want to execute it as well. So we just simply add that. Or actually, maybe let's just add another function block just for the fun of it and call it test function, uh, test function block. And it doesn't do anything special my counters that I always use as example because you can never get enough of counters uh, and now what you can do is you can go back to team explorer go to changes and for example you can click first of all you will see that this file was completely added since the last commit but we can also see that this file is modified we can go to we can go to compare with unmodified and then we'll get this and this is where we need to do a tiny change because what uh, visual studio now does is that it's just looking at the files themselves and uh, looking at them and seeing okay these are just some weird uh, files and it's just presenting them as, as these raw xml files and this is how Beckoff are storing uh, all source code and um, with, with this weird XML annotation. Uh, but what we want to do now is that we want to tell Visual Studio to, instead of using, using your own uh, compare tool, use a compare tool from Beckoff instead. And to do that, we go to uh, Twinket here. 
then we go to tools, we go to Twinkat project compare, which this tool is a tool to basically compare to complete projects, but we can also use this tool to compare individual files. Then we, we press cancel, we go to tools and then configure user tools, uh, export configuration, select git, press OK. And then what we want to do is that we want to, now we want to tell uh, the git global config file, the global git config file to use TC project compare for Twinkat files. And with this tool that Beckoff have done, it does it automatically for you. So if you just press OK here, then Press OK, close this down. And now if we do a compare, it's using the Twinkat tool instead. So the Beckoff tool for this, so TC project compare. And of course, this is much easier to, to read than the, than the XML stuff that we just saw. The nice thing about this is that this works for all kind of Twinkat files. So it doesn't work, just work for structured text or anything, or it also works for IO configuration. It works for for everything that's Twinkat. So you can use it for ladder and, and the graphical programming languages as well. Then it's gonna show the differences in, 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 the, uh, in the graphical programming languages. And, and this is just one of the strengths with Beckhoff. You know, they, they put this tool here and then they don't charge you for it. It's, it's just, they basically have this thought that of course version control is something you shouldn't pay for. And I really wish the rest of the industry, it was, it, it was the same way. So this is really good. So, I recommend you to do exactly what I did because then you're gonna use this tool for doing comparisons instead. This is just so nice because now you can actually go in, in, into any file and if you've worked anything and always do comparisons with anything previously. I want to point out another thing. There are some changes I would really recommend you to do in your development environment because of the way that Beckhoff uh, stores files. There's two changes I'm gonna go through with you or maybe three, I don't remember. It's at least two. And the first one is actually if, if we, um, if you look at these files, if you just look at the raw content of them, you see that they have this weird stuff here. You know, this is this line ID says, from my understanding, this is used when you do an online change and you're gonna, or you're gonna do an online login, then this information is somehow used. I'm not entirely sure how, but it's not anything that we need to store under version control. So this is one of the stuff that we, we're gonna get rid of. Okay, so let's start by changing Twinkat so it doesn't store this information and you do that by going to tools, options, text editor, uh, no, not text editor, uh, Twinkat actually, uh, XE environment, file set, no, that's not the guy, uh, it's right here, Twinkat, PLC environment, write options. This separate line ID is changed to true. What it's gonna do now is that instead of saving all of these line IDs, so this stuff inside each and one, each, each and every uh, source code file, it's gonna store it all of this in a separate file. And then we have that separate file in case we wanna do these online changes, but we don't have to uh, version control it. So we don't have to version control this information because this information is really not necessary to version control. That's the first thing we're gonna do. Um, actually, let's do that now. And then I'm gonna show you if we open the main file and we just resave it, then do you want to reload it? You saw the, f the line IDs were gone. And this is really nice because then we don't need the version control. And I think to be absolutely honest, if, if anyone from Beckhoff is, is watching this, especially from the headquarters and the software development department, I would really recommend you to set this one to true by default, because for some reason this is not a default true. And for all my other uh, watchers that are not from Beckhoff, this information is not stored in the project itself. So this is something that's stored, the setting is stored in your development environment, which means, you know, I've been working with projects with, with many, many developers, and then I've told them, hey guys, please apply this setting, you know, and I when I do code reviews, so I do lots of code reviews with Twinkat code, then I, I always, if I see this, then I just call the guy or girl and, and say, hey, you need to do this setting. And usually I actually put it in the wiki so that everyone knows about what common settings we should use in, in Twinkat. But now you know, so you don't have to make this mistake. The second uh, change we're gonna do is in the XAE environment and file settings. So the way that Twinkat works is that it stores all these different types of configurations. So configurations about IO boxes, ETCAT, uh, drives, uh, so the, the motion stuff and everything in, in one big mega 
blob uh, file. I don't like this because you know if you have just one file uh, that stores all of this then this file is obviously going to change a lot and this file is going to get very big and I prefer to set all of this to true because then each and one of these configurations is going to be stored in its separate file. So if you have an IO box, let's say we, we add an IO device here for an ETCAT slave, you know we have an EL1008 or something, then there's going to be a file created just for that guy, which of course is much easier, which of course makes, makes much more sense because you know when you do code review later or something, then if you just change one file, it's much easier to see the changes in that file than having this 10,000 lines of code file, which you know it's, it's, it makes it a real mess. So my recommendation here is simply change all of this to true. And again, for if anyone from Beckhoff headquarters listens to me now, I would recommend you to, to change this to, tr to, to true. I've actually not encountered a single project, and there's been a few now, where the settings I've showed you here have not been the default. Everyone changes this to, to these settings, and I recommend all my watchers to cha change this. I mean, if you're not doing version control, then this doesn't matter, but my firm belief is that there's not a single reason not to do version control. Even if you do the simplest of the simplest project, and even if you're the only guy, you should do version control. There's no reason not to do version control. It's very unprofessional to not do version control. Press OK. And that's the settings that we need. Now we've done a few changes. We've done a change in the main file and we've done a change by simply adding a function, another function block. And now if we go to, to Team Explorer and again, if you go to, oops, wrong. If you go to changes, you'll now have uh, three files that have been changed. You have the test function block, which we added. So it says add here, so it's not staged. It's just in our in our folder, but it's not been staged yet. So it says you should add this one. And um, we have this guy, which is just changed. So if we first look at this one, you can't compare with, with the previous one, right? Because it's, it's not been staged yet. So th there's nothing to compare against. But if you go to the main and you compare it with the previous one, then with the unmodified one, then you see that, yeah, we've added another instance of the sensor. So, I mean, I think this is really, really good. And there's also another file here called PLC Proy. So if you do a compare with unmodified here as well, then yeah, what it what Beckhoff will show now, what Twinkat will show now is that this PLC Proy is basically a file that stores the information about what files are included in this project. And what we can see if we go to POUs here, then yeah, aha, okay, yeah, we've, we've added another function block. So super useful. So what we'll do now is again, we might want to ch uh, commit all of this. So this is a second commit, or actually let's make a more, uh, a better commit message. Always make good commit messages. Uh, add that a second uh, sensor, ifm sensor instance, add that a test function block. Then commit all. Oops, I forgot. You have to stage this. And you have, yeah, just select stage all. So you, then you, you, you put everything uh, on stage for the commit. And then commit the stage stuff. And now we have a separate commit created. And again, this is only committed to the local repository. If I go here, I still have only uh, the, the initial commit. And we can actually see it here because we only have one commit here. Then we have to push these changes. So go to home sync and push whenever you have internet connectivity which we have now then it's gonna synchronize that successfully pushed to origin main and if we go back here now we have two commits 38 seconds ago so this is quite nice and actually just by looking at github now i realized that there's lots of stuff i would want to cover just about github you know about pull requests issues and everything but there's just so much to cover about version control that this really has to wait for for the next video <laughs> so another thing i want to show is that if you go to solution explorer uh, you can at, in for any file you can right click on it and select this view history and what it's going to show now is the uh, git commit history for this particular file. And we can see that this file has had two commits, right? It was part of the first commit, which uh, where we just initially committed all files, but it's also part of a second commit and where we've had, uh, where we added the second uh, IFM sensor instance. When you worked with 
uh, at Wink at Projects for a while, this this Git commit history is going to be really really long. You know, I I've, I've been working in projects that have been ranging going on for several years, and you know when you're 10 developers working in, in a project and this Git history, it's, it's really nice to be able to see what, what has been happening in the, in the last years, especially if you want to go back to an old commit. Uh, because, for example, you had a, an older version of the software that was maybe more stable than a newer or, or whatever. And then you can, you, know, you can do th this stuff like view commit details, you can compare with previous. So again, compare with previous will again just show the difference to the previous commit. You can select two commits and, and compare these two, so you, which means you can select, if we had 10 commits here, you could select this one and select another one down here, compare these two. I mean, the, the possibilities are just endless. So I just want to finish by showing that everything we've done here is also available in Tortoise Git or any other Git client. So if you go back here, you see that you, if we open a repository, we can track all the changes here as well. So we can press this nice button show log here for this repository and see all the changes and all the commits we've done to, to this particular repository. And here you can, for example, click on this particular commit and see which files have been changed since the, the commit before that. So you see that in this commit we added this file and um, we modified this one and you know you can do the same thing as, as with Visual Studio that you can compare, do compares. The difference here is if we do compare, you remember with Visual Studio we got this nice, I can just quickly show, so in Visual Studio when we did uh, a compare, when we did a compare, then you got the difference uh, like this because it's using the TC project compare, which is the, the Twinkat tool. If you use Tortoise Git, it's going to use Tortoise Git's built-in compare tool instead. So if you do a compare with base, it's going to get the thing. And now we're going to get the raw content. So because Tortoise Git has no idea about Twinkat files, it just shows the, the raw uh, content of the files, the text content, which is anyway the way that Git actually works. It it's basically just comparing the, the the raw text, and here we can see actually, you know, that uh, yeah, the line IDs are gone here because we did the change in in this settings of Twinkat, um, and that we have also added another instance here of uh, of the sensor, but it's basically showing the same information. I of course prefer to use the TC project compare in Visual Studio because this is done specifically for Twinkat, but I think it's very important for you to be aware of these other tools because you know you're gonna work with software, other software that Twinkat in in the future. For example, if you're gonna if you're just gonna use version control to to version control text files or uh, readme files or maybe you're gonna write some Java or or C plus plus or or something else, then then you're gonna work with these more traditional uh, tools. Then you're not gonna use TC Project Compare because TC Project Compare by definition is just for Twinkat. So, so it's important for you to, to know about this. Um, so yeah, but I think that's what I wanted. Well, this is not what I wanted to cover. I want to cover much more because I haven't talked about stuff like like branches and about, you know, if we're two developers. So, you know, if there was another developer here next to me, let's say it was a uh, Jacobina, like, hello, uh, uh, someone else here next to me and we were going to uh, work together. Uh, then how would that look like, you know, because then we're going to commit to and, and push to the same repository, we're going to get conflicts, so we haven't been ta talking about that, but that's unfortunately just has to wait for another video, because this video is already getting quite big, so yeah. This was a very, very, very short introduction to version control in Twinkat 3. There are many concepts I had to skip, even many of the basic ones like branching, merging, handling of conflicts, rebase and cherry pick. These concepts are important to know when working in a team on a common project. Version control is such an important topic that I will get back to it in other videos of this channel. One of the things I want you to take with you is the fact that not doing version control is unprofessional and it's going to bite you in your back in the future if you don't use it. You should always put your projects under version control, no matter project size. Don't wait with it, but get yourself an account on any of the popular Git repositories such as GitHub, GitLab or Azure DevOps and start gaining experience. Thank you very much for listening to this first part of the advanced series. I'll see you in the next part where we will look into how you work with several versions of Twinkat at the same time. See you.